making the Southern Women data set, um, unless you happen to have it already. In that, uh, there's also the lecture slides. You need the R file, that's the code. So the one that ends dot R will give you this code so you can match what I'm doing up on the screen. There's also an R markdown file that ends, well, an HTML file made from R markdown that you can open up in a uh, browser. And this is the same as the code just in this format where you see the code and the output. So I might refer to that um, because sometimes it, I'm only gonna refer to that if we need to read something that we can't see in this squinched up window that you need to be so zoomed in so they can see it in the back, et cetera. So the R markdown is, the R HTML file is really just there as a, a backup. Um, and that's for your reference later. It's not pretty because sometimes we do the wrong thing to demonstrate that it's wrong and we need to fix it. So don't, uh, get distracted by that. All right, but we're gonna start from this R file. The, the goal of this lab is really to just give you some of the tools and syntax to do the descriptives we talked about. So we talked about uh, Bonasich centrality. How do you actually calculate it? How do you make a graph that would look like the graph that I had in my PowerPoint? So to get started, you're, you want R to be open, you want this to be open, um, and we'll, we'll get going. As always, if you have any questions, if you're, if you're not following, feel free to stop and ask me any questions that might apply to the group, or if you have a, I did this and I got a scary error and it's not working, raise your hand and the, there's plenty of DNAC helpers in the back who will come help you. So I've got a few notes. We're using our classic fake ad health data that we've been using here the whole time. This is made to be run after the data cleaning lab. So I'm assuming that you made the clean Ad Health Network, you did all of the edgeless construction and everything that you did with Maria Cristina. So if I was on my own doing research, starting a project, you would need to, I would need to do all of that first before I started some of these descriptives because there's no point in doing descriptives of a network if you didn't construct the network correctly and you made up a whole bunch of fake friends that aren't really in your data or something like that, okay? Um, so to make that work, you need to either download the contents of that Dropbox folder um, or point to the folder where you have all this information. We need to set our working directory. So this line of code at 35, um, again, you need to change that to match your directory. So this is what it would be. In fact, this is not what it's gonna be on this computer. That's what it is on my machine, right? So if I wanna find my directory, if you forget your file path or you tried to set your directory and it didn't work, you can kind of cheat to get there through the point and click. So I'm gonna go to session, set working directory, choose it, and I'm gonna go find the folder that has all of my info. And it'll set my working directory, okay. and I could um, copy that and add that back into my code if I wanna save it for next time. So that's right there in the code, session, set working directory, choose directory, and you can find the folder where you want all of your info to be. For a good practice, we're going to uh, clear anything in our data set. We're going to load Tidyverse and StatNet. Notice we're loading them from the library, so we're assuming you already have it installed. My analogy that I've been saying to everyone, I feel like, in the past two days is installing is like buying the book and putting it on your shelf. You installed a package. If you want to look something up, you have to get it off the shelf to look at it, right? And so that's the difference between installing it and loading it into your library, making it accessible. So right now, we need to load it into our library, even if we've already installed it. So I'm gonna do that. StatNet always prints out a bunch of scary red information that is not wrong. They're just telling you to give them credit. You might have noticed today that there's a new update of StatNet out. So you might wanna update that at some time. I'm not gonna do that right now because I would have to close R. I'm gonna see how far we can get not updating. So we'll see how that goes. Can you hear and see in the back decently? Okay, just word of warning if it is kind of fuzzy, fuzzy um, there's a lot of seats available in the front. So you can come up here. We've got some questions. Can some labbers come help, please? You okay? Do you need to be? Oh, thank you. That would be wonderful. It's, yeah. Okay, don't, don't sweat it. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can follow along too and you can see enough to know what you need to do. If it's an issue that we've got seven seats up front here, Please come up front. I don't 
spit that much. Okay, so if you want help, you can always get help for a particular package and it pops up down here in your help window. So if you wanted to learn more about StatNet, it would tell you all about it. We're gonna move on to importing our data. So we're gonna bring in that nice clean network data set that we made with Maria Christina earlier, okay? So for me to load it, I don't want to have my directory up here. Um, the cheaty example, if you don't have it in your code, is you can also open things. That's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna open the R data that ends in the right. Yes, I want to load it. So I'll put that code up there for reference. I'm going to comment out my old one because that was the, on my machine. So now you should have data in your global environment that's called AHS network. That is a large network. So if you don't have that, now's a good time to raise your hand and get help from a DNET helper. Does anybody have any questions? It's the same one, same old thing. If you left it up, you got it. You're good. As long as it should have that same name, AHS network. Yep, nope, you're right. That's, that's uh, perfectly fine if you have it. So if we just print the name of the network, we could check our network characteristics. So if we just print, we say AHS network, R will tell us all about our network. So we can see we've got 440 vertices, which is what StatNet calls nodes, 440 nodes. It is directed, it's not a hypergraph, we don't have loops, it's not bipartite. We've got about 2,000 edges and it has some vertex attributes. So it looks good for what we, if it doesn't say that, then you need to either go find the network or you need to get help to, to construct that network. I think we had a question up here if somebody's available. All right, so then we have our network data loaded that we had saved and cleaned earlier. So just as a reminder, nodes or vertices here are students, edges are friendship nominations, and we've got students who could name up to five male and five female friends nested in schools grades seven through 12. So if you wanted to get the network size, we could use the command network size. We printed the description of the network, so we already know it has 440 nodes, but sometimes that's a, a good command to run if you're looking at um, you have multiple networks loaded and you want to have it explicitly in your code that you are counting up the edges. We could also count the dyads in our network. And then we can move into centrality measures. So does anybody have a question at this point? That's just a little bit to make sure we have the correct network, that there doesn't look like there were any problems making our data. Of course, everything's going swimmingly so far because we just made the data with Maria Christina and we make it artificially clean and stuff so that you can have it. So it's not very exciting, but I promise it'll be plenty exciting and frustrating when it's your own messy data. So we're going to measure degree centrality first. So the default of the degree function is total degree. Just a reminder in R, the degree function here is in the StatNet package. So StatNet has a function called degree where you're telling R, measure the degree on this network. So it has the name of the network and we make it an object called total degree that we can look at later. So we're going to measure the total degree. Again, you don't have to highlight it every time. That's my habit so that you guys know where I'm clicking. Because we have directed data, we can further distinguish in degree and out degree. So if we want to measure in degree, we take that same function from StatNet degree, we tell it which network to use, but we specify we want in degree. So we're going to measure in degree as well. So you run that. I tried to give you comments in the code that remind you what things are and tell you where to look it up in the Wasserman and Faust text. So hopefully that's useful later if, if um, that's something you need a refresher on. Just like in degree, we could specify out degree and measure out degree for every node. So if you notice, we've got a, a bunch of different values over here in our global environment because we're, we're saving all of this information. When you've calculated these centrality measures, you can use standard R methods to explore them just like we would any other information in R, just like it's any other kind of R object that could be a variable. 
So for example, I could plot in degree by out degree. So I might want to know, are the kids that um, are very popular, are they sending friendship nominations too? So I plot it. I'm going to click this zoom thingy so we can look at it a little closer. All right. And it's kind of odd looking because it, it's this very regular pattern, um, which makes sense because there's only whole measures for degree. You can't nominate half a friend. You can only nominate whole numbers. And we've got a lot of observations stacked on top of each other, which kind of makes sense. There's probably a lot of people who have you know, named five friends and got named five times. So there we have a lot of observations in our graph stacked on top of each other. A better plot here. We're going to run all of this plot code together like this and make a prettier plot. So this labels our graph. This makes a, a diagonal and um, let me zoom in a diagonal of where you, if you had zero on one and zero on the other, etc. It uses individual nodes labels. So like if we wanted to examine outliers, we might want to say like, uh oh, node 151, whoever's and you can replace this with any information you have about your network. So if I had people's names, if I had institutional names or particular respondent IDs, I could use that as well, right? So this is a way to examine particular nodes. And it also did uh, what's called jitter, and it kind of moved them a little bit away from being exactly stacked on top of each other if they had the exact value. So you get these kind of fuzzy clusters down here that, although they're not legible, at least indicate that there's a lot of people in that particular area. So this might be useful if you're thinking about something like outliers, if you're um, trying to just in general get to know your network data. It's a very quick and dirty graph. It's not terribly informative. It's not something you're ever going to publish in a paper. But this is just kind of trying to show you the steps of how you might start to explore your network data. You notice that our, our graph is not completely square. We've got kids that are much more popular uh, than our, our sending out degrees, than our gregarious or expansive. Does anybody know why? Who would guess why? So they're nominated more by other people than they themselves can nominate. Why overall would we see that direction of skew instead of a square graph? They're limited to five. So this is not meaningful, interesting information about our network. This is the fact that we capped the survey at naming five friends of male and female friends. So exactly right, that they're getting nominated a lot more because our instrument artificially capped how many out degrees they could send. Do we have another question before hand? Oh, sorry. I think one person's asking for DNEC lab help, right? And then a question for the crew. Yeah. Yep. If they have in, in degree of zero, of course, pending how you did your data cleaning. Yeah. Uh, presumably, we didn't kick those people out. Yep. Um, and depending on your method of collection, right? If they had a roster where that was possible, et cetera. <laughs> yes, it's fake. It's all fake. Don't don't go use it. I tried to put that everywhere. Like ad health, it's not it's not real. Okay. Real ad health is much messier. So this is everything we just said. Okay. All right, so maybe we want to take this degree information and use it in a more interesting networky way than just kind of plotting, a, uh, plotting it on a graph. So we're going to plot our network graph, our sociogram, with the degree centrality for each node. To do that, we need to tell StatNet, hey, make that degree thing an attribute of each node. So you set a vertex attribute set the vertex attribute to be their degree. So we're going to call that attribute, unsurprisingly, the exact same thing, right? So I'm going to say, in this network, make something called total degree, which is that measure I just made that was total degree, and set that to be an attribute of each vertex. Okay, so this is just a, a chunk um, of code telling StatNet, put those things in the format so that you can use it now in my graph data. So now we're going to plot our, our network in a very simple graph um, using in degree to size the nodes. I wanted to point out that this little bit of code that's called set seed. Um, you might notice my, 
code numbers might be up, like the code lines might be off from you by just a tiny bit because I had I added in the code to adjust for this machine up here instead of my own code. So if it's 164 on here and it's slightly off for you, just, just be aware of that. Setting that seed is um, if we want our network to get projected in the same way every time. So if you're just, if you're going to be making a whole bunch of different networks, uh, the algorithm underneath doesn't care like who is in which position. It's just going to be generating a bunch of networks. So if you want it to look the same every time where the same people are in the same position, you need to set a seed. Or there, there's a couple other ways that I'll uh, use later as examples to do it. But that, that's what I was talking about in my lecture when like the graph looked the same way all the time and then suddenly it didn't. It was because I forgot to set the seed and I didn't do that. So we're going to set the seed. So the, the, point, the point of setting a seed is that if you want it to look the same, you would use that same seed to get the same look. You don't have to set seed one, two, three, four, five. That's right. That, you pick whatever. You can follow your heart on that one and pick whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. All right. So just to give you a step-by-step -step here of all of the sudden our network got, graph got a little bit complicated in terms of the code. So we're looking at the plot and we're saying use this network that we named as our network. We're going to size the vertex, each vertex, by in degree. So the code, the um, command for that is vertex.cex. That just means size. We're going to set that equal to each ver the in degree of each vertex. I'm setting each vertex to have 50 sides because then it makes it look like a circle. And that makes it nice. And I'm telling it not to print out labels because it would just be visual clutter. And right now we don't really care about who's who. We're just looking at it. Okay. So I'm going to plot my network. And you should get something like this. No, it's a disaster. So what happened was when we sized nodes by in degree, we have some nodes that have a very high in degree that kind of took over visually in our graph. All right, so we had a few very high nodes that just squished everything else out visually. So to do that, we're going to rescale in degree. We're just going to say in degree divide by 10 or something. It would still be proportional, right? It's monotonic. So um, it's not going to change the information. We're just doing that. I'm multiplying it by 0.2 so that visually those nodes don't get so gigantic. Okay. Any questions about that? Let's run this piece of code. Again, I'm using the same seed. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. I just picked them. You, the point is you need to pick something that you can use later to make it the same. I could pick one, two, three, four, five. I could pick 78. It doesn't Demonstrate that. Here, can I? So visually, if I I ran it without setting the seed, and it looked like this, whereas when I do set the seed, it looks like this every time. It's the same information. It just like rotated it a little bit. But like, if I want it in my paper to have like the same nodes in the same spot, if I always want this person to be in the middle of the top, and this component to be on top, this component to be on the bottom, I have to set it to be the same every time. It's the same information, it's still correct, right? It just got all kind of rearranged. Oh, there, there, there's nothing wrong with any of them. The point is, if we want it to look the same, you have to tell it, set it, make the algorithm use this to make it look the same. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's not even a question of right or wrong. It's making it match so that when we're publishing it, it looks the same. I guess you should. You ought to. Like, if you, first of all, we all ought to be, like, sharing our code, right, to make everything inherently reproducible. And if you're sharing your code, you should have a seed in your code that you share. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, ideally, whatever anyone did, even if you didn't have the seed, it should be correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yep, yep. I mean, it's information to produce that visualization. And you'll see that if you, you know, for example, when people who are doing blogs about visualization entries, they will tell you what seed they did to get that. Yep. 
OK, so we've plotted in degree. We see some variation in in degree, some uh, high in degree clusters in the center of our network, right? But they didn't take over and explode the whole graph. We can plot out degree. So if you remember, we had calculated total degree, in degree, and out degree. We told uh, StatNet, size the nodes by in degree. Now we're going to tell StatNet, size the nodes by out degree. Again, we're going to just make it a little bit smaller so it doesn't explode visually. We're using our same seed. I also set the color of the node just so that when we look back, it'll be a different color and we can compare. So now you should get something like this, right? A lot less, a little bit less variation on out degree because it was capped at 10. In your own machine, you can kind of um, click through quickly to compare all the different graphs, right? It's not meaningful to do it up here because it's not zoomed in enough and it's so tiny, it's useless. But you can do that if you want to. We could plot total degree the same way. Any questions with applying these centrality measures to size your nodes when you're plotting your sociogram in our fake ad health data? It can run a ton of lines of code. If there, if there is a limit, we have not hit it with these five lines of code. Okay, we're going to move into closeness. So here, just like with degree, StatNet has a function called closeness. So we're telling StatNet, measure closeness on this network. This refers to the fact that um, we have directed data. So digraph means we have directed instead of undirected ties. And we're telling it, measure closeness as directed. So we make a closeness object. If we just tell it to print that name, It'll tell us each node's value of closeness. And you might notice we have a problem. Everyone has value 0. And in fact, if we do a histogram of closeness, our histogram is completely empty. And if you recall in the lecture, closeness doesn't work if you have disconnected components. If you have isolates or if you have groups that are not connected, the distance is infinite. infinite. And when you go to calculate closeness, it freaks out and doesn't work. Yep, you could index. Right, so you could index the highest, the nodes with the highest closeness. Yep. 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 So remember, you've made, when we do it this way, we are making a closeness object, and then you can kind of manipulate the information associated with that, just like you would anything else in R. So just like you would want to pick the top 10 on some other variable in R. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, so. If we want to look at closeness and only look at things that are connected, we're going to tell R to only look at the largest component. We're specifying a strong component, which means you're taking it into account directionality. Right? So weak components are for undirected networks. So we're going to make a component object. We're going to recalculate closeness, indexing that component. So if you notice before, we just had AHS network comma. Now we've got the AHS network indexing only things that are in that largest component object that I made. Okay, so do the network, but only the largest component items and calculate closeness. And this time, if we look at it, so I'm going to run these two together and get a graph, we'll see we have values for each node for closeness, and we can plot the, the, uh, each node's values for the um, distribution of closeness in the network. We get something like this. So again, this is not for all of our data. This is only for the largest component. You could visualize this on the graph just like we did with degree. So you could print out your sociogram and say make the, the nodes with the higher values bigger. I'm not going to do that because all you would do is take the exact same code and instead of saying in degree, say closeness. All right, so I, I think that's a good test if you're following along, if this is new to you and you want to do it yourself. We could also calculate undirected closeness. So when we were calculating closeness, we said, treat this like a directed graph and use directed closeness. If you change that to graph 
and undirected, you could get undirected closeness if that's what you were interested in. Or that's what it ought to be if your data is inherently undirected. Any questions? For Bonasich centrality, um, again, this is indicating connections to more highly connected alters or being popular among the popular people. Um, we can change that beta parameter, which StatNet calls exponent. And as a reminder, when it's closer to zero, we're emphasizing local structure like degree. When it's closer to one, it's emphasizing the global reach. And you could make it negative if you want to look at um, higher scores that are connected to less well-connected alters. Just like closeness, Right? It won't calculate it if you have separate components, or at least I don't know how to calculate it on separate components. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, you could, if you don't, it'll just write over it. So if that's what you were interested in. So, okay, so the question was, um, if I want to redo closeness and make it undirected, do I have to change the name of the object to closeness three? You could if you want to make a third kind of closeness. If you want to overwrite the other one, you could just call it closeness or closeness two, and it'll overwrite the one you made that was directed with the undirected version. So that's generally the good rule of thumb in R, that if you call something by the same name, it's going to overwrite it. So you want to make sure if you're doing that, that you want that. And that, that might be the case. That might be correct. That might be appropriate for your data. That might be what you want to do, and that can be a good thing, but you don't want to accidentally overwrite it. Okay, good question. Okay, so on to Bonasich centrality, we've got a little reminder of um, what the beta parameter can be. And we're gonna, again, just gonna calculate that on the largest component. So we're telling um, StatNet the name of the, the function is BonPow, for Bonasich power centrality. If you hover over it, it'll tell you all the options that that function can take, which I just accidentally demonstrated. Um, and then it's a network. Again, we're gonna say only look at the largest strong component, so take the rows from the strongest component object that we made, take the columns that are in that object that we made, treat this like a directed graph, and we're gonna set beta to be one. We could look at the value for each node. If we wanted to, it seems like it worked. We at least got something. We could do a histogram, a histogram of our values, and we get something that looks like this. So it's, uh, kind of a, a very few low Bonasich and high Bonasich nodes when we have beta set to one, most are around zero. We could recalculate with a different beta parameter. So again, this is the same thing. You'll notice the only difference is I changed exponent to 0.25. So I set my beta to be exponent uh, 0.25 and I said, make the title of my graph Bonasich when beta is 0.25. Okay, but it's doing the same command. So if we calculate with a lower Bonasich parameter, here I'm calling it Bonasich 2 because I'm going to compare them later just for the heck of it to show you the difference. Um, but again, if you wanted that to be like your Bonasich centrality measure that you created, you could just overwrite it. So we see kind of the, the difference in the distribution here when we have a lower parameter. We, have, uh, we don't have the values going up quite so high as in the global reach. So a bit of skew. And we could calculate it with a negative beta. So I'm going to run this chunk. So here I set Bonasich 3 using a beta that's negative 0.5. Yeah. Yep, the label of the x uh, axis. Yep. I, so I know sometimes like the, there's extra little bits and bobs in the code that I'm not talking about please stop and ask me about it. The reason I did that is because later when you make a table and you want to make a label, now you have the syntax for it. Because that can be one of the most frustrating things about R is you have to go find all the little pieces of syntax to label stuff and to make it have the decimals go out two places and et cetera. So I tried to give that to you so you have that as a resource as much as possible. But I know that also if you're a beginner, that makes it look scarier and it makes it harder to follow. So there's our negative parameter. So maybe we want to look at these things on our graph. So again, we're going to plot Bonasich centrality. I set, um, so it's only on the strongest component of our network. Size our nodes by Bonasich 2, which is when the beta was 0.25, I think. Um, I made it the color gold, and I have the, the seed set. So when we do that, we get this. You'll notice it's just our component, our largest component. 
but maybe we want to plot the other bonus that we made where the beta was negative and see what that looks like in our network. So again, we have the same seed because we want the individuals to be in the same position of the network. We don't want our network to like rotate or, or re-lay out. And you can see the difference there, that some individuals that were not right, looking quite so highly central on their Bonasich power centrality on the, the previous graph where our beta was 0.25 now suddenly look much more important when beta was negative. And in fact, we might want to look at them side by side. And so to do that, we're going to tell R, make this display pane over here have one row and two columns. So we set the parameters to have one row and two columns. Now we're going to rerun both plots. You could just call them again. Here we're going to rerun it just for uh, evenness pedagogically. And now we can look at both of them side by side. So we have our beta when it's 0.25 and our beta when it's 0.5. And you can see that that is giving a higher Bonasich centrality to different nodes. Any questions at this point? No such thing. Yeah, I know. It's that, it's that, so annoying. It's that color cheat sheet that Maria Christina put in the Dropbox. That is the thing I use all the time. Or I Google R colors <laughs> like a hundred times. But, and then I pick one that looks pretty. That's what I do. <laughs> so we're going to talk more about that later. Um, there's different kinds of colors if you want to make like a, a heat ramp or like a rainbow scale and stuff like that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Okay, so then this is just kind of describing what we observe. So if you come back later and you completely forget which uh, Bonasich centrality means or what the beta parameters do, you have a bit of a blurb there telling you about it. So you could look at the gold plot on the left where we set the beta to 0.25. Right, nodes with higher values are in these kind of dense central places in the network. And when the beta is negative, it's giving higher centrality to people who are reaching others who are not as well connected in the network. So we might think this individual over here is really important for reaching people in this cluster. Right? They have kind of outsized power in their ability to reach this group. Whereas over here, these people might have outsized power given who they are connected to. So it's trying to just get the interpretation a little bit. Yeah. It depends on your question. So I think that most of the time you are going to pick a beta parameter that makes sense for your question because you're going to care about local versus global structure. You're going to care about somebody who has power over, with people who are also very powerful versus somebody who has power over people who are relatively less powerful. Um, and so I think that Unless you're doing a methods paper that's like, hey, look at the effects of this beta tuning parameter, which is not the case since Jim also said that it had already been published in JOSC, we're probably not doing that. Um, then, you know, like most of the time we're not interested in that direct comparison. We pick an appropriate one and we're interested in going from there. But that's a good question. But if for some reason you want to say that, like you want to say, hey, look, these are people who are powerful among other well connected people. These are people who are powerful and well connected among less powerful people. If that's of interest to your research question, go for it. Nope, so that was that one little snippet of code that said set up a two panel display. Then the next two things that you run will show up in those two spots. So if I, like here for example, I've set it to be a two panel display. If I, I have code to turn it back to just one panel, if I didn't do that, it'll take whatever graph I make next and put it in this spot. And it'll have the old one that was left over. And whatever graph I do next will go in the second spot. And you can, if you want to, you can have a side by side that's a 10 by 10. It doesn't matter. So um, that's purely based on setting the, the cell sizes of the plot window. So that's a good question because it's an easy piece to miss and it can get very frustrating when you make all your plots and they come out in the same window. Any other questions? 
All righty, let's keep rolling. Information centrality. Um, so again, this is like kind of combining closeness and Bonasich centrality. It's like Bonasich centrality, but not limited to the geodesic. Always, if you want more information about a function, you can do question mark, whoop, question mark, and the function, and it'll pop up in your help window, right? And it'll tell you all about. So it tells you that you have to give it a graph, right? It's telling you about nodes if you want to get in the weeds. So it's telling you about like the components of the argument if you want to specify it in R. If it's well documented, it gets into the graph theory behind it and what you're actually calculating and references as well. So that's a, a great place to be a reference. So we're going to calculate info centrality on our network, just like we did the others. There's relatively um, not very much variation here. We've got a few people kind of up here clustered at 0 0.002 and then other people at zero. So we're going to move on because information centrality just doesn't seem particularly informative in this case. Um, but again, if that's of interest, or if you think information centrality should be informative and something doesn't look right, then that's when you've got to start thinking about your data and if there's issues and what you accidentally did. Okay. So we're going to calculate betweenness. Again, we tell it use the betweenness function on our network and its directed data. And I'm just going to run this chunk together because I think by now you've seen the process of like, do this, look at the measure for each node and make a histogram. So now I'm going to do it in one chunk, but you don't have to. So we get the values for each node. We get our histogram in between us. You'll notice this is a very skewed distribution. Right? We've got some values up there in the thousands. Because some values for between us got gigantic, if we want to plot it, I'm going to rescale it by taking the square root. So I'm going to make an object called between square root that is the square root of between us. And now I can plot that. Again, I'm going to use the square root of between us divided by 20 just uh, for visual purposes. You get something like this. So we see nodes in our bridging positions. Um, maybe we want to visualize in degree and betweenness together. So here I'm going to have a plot I don't need to recalculate in degree and betweenness because we've already calculated them. We have them saved as objects in our global environment. So I'm going to plot them in only on the um, biggest cluster just for visual purposes. I'm going to set the um, size of the vertex to be in degree, making it a little bit smaller so we, it's visual and it doesn't like the popular people don't swamp our graph. And I'm setting the color of the vertex to be heat colors, which is um, comes in base R, and I'm setting it to be heat colors based on betweenness. And that's just a little bit of syntax, syntax there to make it work on our betweenness. When you do that, you get something like this. So it's kind of a heat map. And if you're like me, you're like, well, I, I don't know, red, yellow, like which one's which? I can't tell. What about this like big one that's pale? What's that supposed to mean? So you can look at what the colors represent. Um, if you want to check the direction of heat colors, we could do a little bar plot and say like, well, which, which color's which? And that'll just tell you. So sometimes there's a couple of scales that come like baked into R that are pre-constructed like that. And I use that color cheat sheet every time I have to use one of them to know what they're called. Like there's one called rainbow, there's one called earth something, whatever like that. But if we go back to this plot, you'll note that we have, um, right, we have some bridges. So for example, this, we have some people who are do doing a lot of the bridging work who are highly popular, but not necessarily. We can represent both in the network when we're using size and color. Maybe we want to compare these measures um, not just by visualizing them in one network, but by comparing the correlation of the measures. Oh, so if you get an error like this, like error, bigger margins too large, you need to make your plot window bigger and try again. Well, it might not work up here because I'm, so, I'm so zoomed in, this should be working on yours. If not, let me know and we'll all troubleshoot together, but I don't want to waste time. Just this is an artifact of everything having to be so zoomed in up here. See how, if I can get it one more time and then I'll stop. No. Okay. Did anybody else get it? Yeah. Okay. So I won't belabor that up here. That's just one of the hard things about trying to project R so that the people in the back of the room can see it. 
Um, we could compare the correlations of our degree measures. Okay. If you want to see how these are working together, this is also a sign of maybe something hinky is going on with one of them that could indicate like clustering or something like that that you need to explore further. Right? But again, this is just one tiny piece of all of the functions of R that are not network specific. Right? Once you have calculated objects for these centrality measures, you have that as information about the node to do with what you will. So if you want to look at the people with the 10 highest between a centrality, or you want to look at the people with the 10 lowest between a centrality, you can use all the many functions of R to do that. Okay, any questions? Before we leave, I think we're leaving centrality measure land. Yeah. Okay, I've got some notes on um, basically saying that we're not doing both structural holes and all those measures that we talked about, efficiency, redundancy, and where to find them if you want to do them. One is that they're not uh, built into StatNet, they're built into iGraph. So you would need to use iGraph for those. Um, we're going to use iGraph here in a second with two mode network data, so we'll practice switching between them, and uh, we'll practice the iGraph syntax. I also wanted to give uh, notice that if you're interested in brokerage, brokerage is one of those terms where there's like seven different measures that everyone calls brokerage, and you need to make sure you're using the right persons. So when we talked about brokerage in the lecture, it was BERT's brokerage, the measure that's built into SNA, um, which is the base package for networks that comes in R, is the Gould Fernandez measure. It's totally different. So again, any measure you're doing that's new, you should do the question mark function and look at the output about what it's actually measuring, who it's citing, things like that. Even if this is scary and not very meaningful to you because you don't know what a lot of these terms mean, um, it'll give you an idea of what you're actually measuring. Question? No, okay. Sorry, you had a question me face. I don't want to <laughs> call out, but it was like a pondering look. All right, so moving on to centralization. So now we've, uh, we've assessed the centrality measures for individual nodes, but maybe we want to think about the structure of our network overall. So we can measure density. So again, this is the ratio of observed to all possible ties on our network, and we say that it is um, directed. Notice that here I didn't make a density object. I just told it measure graph density on this network like a directed network. If I wanted to use density later, so say I have 500 networks and I want to calculate the density of each one, I would want to save that as an object that could be accessed later, just like we did before. We said make an object called closeness2 and run this function on it. So you're still using that, but if you only have one network and you don't necessarily want to save that information, you just want it printed out, you don't have to. Uh, was there a question about what that would look like? Because I could demonstrate very quickly. So as we expect, density is pretty low for adolescent social networks. We can look at the degree distribution. So um, we already calculated degree. So really all we have to do is make a graph of it, right? We've calculated the degree for each node. We just need to make a histogram of the degree distribution. In fact, I think we did make a histogram of degree. So you've already seen the degree distribution. Maybe we want to look at the degree distribution of in and out degree and total degree altogether. So we're going to tell it to make, um, make our, oop, sorry, make our display able to look at three things at the same time, and we're going to make three different histograms, so we can look at our degree distributions together. So we see our typical kind of long-tailed distribution for in degree, um, power law distribution for total degree, out degree gets truncated at ten. There's a lot of people in our network who didn't send any ties but were named. So again, that might lead us to think, like somebody asked earlier, well, they might not have taken our survey, but they got included. You know, again, it's fake data, so who knows? But. So degree distribution can be useful. We're going to put our display back to the one cell. We can calculate our clustering coefficient based on transitivity. So that's the graph transitivity of our network. And this gives us a clustering coefficient of 0.22. So just as a reminder, the, the values are a little bit different from the example in the lecture, because in the lecture, I was only looking at grades 7 and 8. So I reduced it down to 35 notes. So our values are a little bit different. It's the same fake data, but not the, the, it's a smaller subset of the fake data. You could specify in this graph transitivity measure of measuring only the weak census. Weak census is just going to give you a count of transitive triads. And before, just like if you don't know, if you're like, well, how the heck am I supposed to know that's called the weak census? What do I, you go over here and you search, and it'll tell you about it. So you can look up G trans, and it'll tell you all of the different elements of G trans 
that you could specify and what they mean in here. Okay? We could do centralization of any other centrality measure. So we could look at the dispersion of the betweenness centrality or the um, Bonasich centrality in our graph. So centralization of in degree. We could get a value for that. We could get the centralization of betweenness. Again, we could save these to objects if there's something we want to use later. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, saying, oh, it has a between, uh, betweenness centralization of 0 0.016 doesn't mean anything to me. I have no, like, great, congratulations. I don't know. I don't know what that means. So, sure, you got a centralization uh, parameter. But what does that actually mean to have that centralization of a network? Now, if you have multiple networks, it might be interesting to compare across them. We could say, well, this is the friendship network, and this is the advice network, and one is way more centralized. So we expect there's some type of hierarchy happening here, right? For example, another approach is what's called the conditional uniform graph test. So we could compare what we observe in our graph to what we would expect from graphs uh, generated by chance, generated randomly, right? And we could say for a graph of the same size or the same dyad census, or the same degree distribution, or whatever. So we could say, compare it to something by chance, but not just any old graph by chance, what you would expect by chance for the exact same, um, for simulated networks uh, that are exactly the same on some particular parameter. I'm noting here in the code, we're not getting too in depth into simulating today because this kind of gets beyond the bounds of uh, descriptive networks, and you'll get much more about simulation on Thursday with Brian. And these can take a little bit of time to run, um, so I'm going to start one right now, but if your machine is slow, you might not want to run it because it might take a while and then you'll sit here. So um, just a reminder, if you're new to R, when you are running something and you tell it to do it and nothing happens, it's thinking if it has this little stop sign. Okay, so the stop sign doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means like the little mouse is running on the little wheel inside our computer. Okay. If you want it to, if you want to force stop it, if you press that stop sign, if you click on it, it'll quit whatever you're doing. So if you're doing something that should take 10 seconds and it starts taking 10 minutes, you know you have a problem and you can stop it. A lot of times if you are making R think very hard and you press that stop sign, it's going to freeze and you're going to have to close your session and hope that you saved recently. So think twice <laughs> before you do that, at least in my experience on my grad student computer. So, all right. <laughs> so it did it, the stop sign stopped. It didn't print anything out because we didn't tell it to. So now we're going to say print that thing that you just, oops, sorry, that you just calculated, that object that we saved. And so here it kind of tells us what we just did. It did 100, or sorry, 1,000 simulations. And the observed value was 0.03. And the probability um, that the simulations were greater than the observation was 1 to 0. So this would apply to a traditional p-value here. It's so strong for us, it's 1 and 0. What does that mean? Let's plot it to try and figure out what that means. So this means that the in-degree centralization that we observe is much less than what would be expected by chance out of 1,000 simulations. So 1,000 simulations had uh, in-degree distributions like this, and ours was all the way over here. So it's a lot less centralized than we would expect. We could do the same thing with transitivity. So here I'm going to run this all together and plot it. Note that I'm saying test the transitivity of our network against chance networks that have the same density, that have the same number of edges. So I've specified edges. You could put um, a lot of other options in there. So you could put in dyads and size, I think, right? But here I'm just specifying it on density just to demonstrate that. So it's thinking. We've got the little stop sign. This time it's, I told it to do it, print it, and graph it. So we should see all of those things pop up when it's done. It's going to take a lot longer for transitivity um, because transitivity involves a lot more calculation, right? So it's, it's thinking now in our graph for every time that I is connected to J and J is connected to K, is I connected to K? So it's doing that for every node in our graph. It's going to take a hot second, right? And it's going to take even longer if you have bigger data than our little fake high school here. Any questions? Well, we have a good naturally enforced stopping point for calculating transitivity. Okay, so here if you notice, our observed transitivity in our graph is way out here on the red line, and here's what was generated by chance. So we're observing much more transitivity than you would expect for a random network of the same density. That's good because it's a social network. 
we would expect transitivity to be a real social process. And this is kind of giving us evidence for that. There's something going on here that's part of a social process that's not just what happens by chance. The reason I wanted to demonstrate these tests is because I think that these are a really smart starting point before you get into much more complicated predictive models. So when you're running an ergum, you're going to be thinking about things like what is the, the um, effect of transitivity? Or if you're running a Sienna model, you're going to be looking at how can I measure an influence process net of the normal network process of reciprocity or transitivity. So before you go through the, the trauma of coding one of those models, you might want to check first, is there any kind of signal that transitivity is a real thing in my network, a real social process? And this is giving us some evidence that yes, there is more transitivity than we would expect by chance. Okay, does that make sense, hopefully? All right, we're gonna keep rolling here. So we can calculate the, uh, count up the number of symmetric dyads. So we're moving into things that lead into making groups here. So we've got 455 mutual dyads. We can look at the ratio of reciprocal dyads, or sorry, reciprocated edges versus all edges. So of all the ties in our network, how many of them are reciprocal or mutual? So it's about 43% of all our ties are reciprocal. There are a lot of other ways you could specify that. So if you wanted to measure um, out of all dyads, how many dyads instead of out of all edges or things like that, um, you could do that too or non-nulls, I think. We can also calculate the triad census, which is conveniently called triad census. And this spits out the um, number of triads in your network that match that little UNAN code that we talked about earlier. You'll notice that some triads are pretty common, like transitive um, triads. So we have 108 triads where all three people said they're all friends with each other, right? Or sorry, all the ties were mutual. Um, and we have very few cycles. So we have very few times where like I said I'm friends with Leanne and Leanne said she's friends with Joe and Joe said he's friends with me but none of us agreed, okay? Um, this is just a reminder of what all those things mean because if you're like me, you will never remember when you have to. Yeah. Trying to sample from the complete network. I'm not following. The triad census. So remember, this is just descriptive. So before you do any kind of inferring, you need to, to stop and take a beat, right? So this is just telling you in your entire network how many groups of three people have this pattern. So for example, we have a ton of nodes, a ton of groups of three that are not connected. In our network, there are only 16 times where we observe this cyclical pattern. Right? There's 108 times where there was a triad that was connected by three mutual ties. Okay, so this is just purely descriptive. You will um, be able to use things like, just like with the conditional uniform graph tests, you'll be able to compare it against chance and things like that later. But for now, we're just describing what we observe. So we can calculate components. We already did this because we had to do it to be able to run closeness and Bonasic. But we could calculate strong or weak components. You specify strong or weak in the syntax. You can look at the strong component. We could look at component membership. So this would tell you um, the components each node belongs to. We can look at the size of components. So that, oops, sorry, this might be useful then if you want to so, for example, we had a question earlier like, I have a network with 200 nodes, and when I try to visualize it, I can't see anything. So it's just a big glob of nodes and ties, right? Like it's a hairball. What am I supposed to do? Well, if you want to pull out a component, particular components of interest, you might want to find components of different size to pull out. So we have a lot of, um, right, a lot of variability in size. There's a lot of small disconnected dyads, and then we have a lot of bigger chunks. We might want to use the by components. Remember, you could have k components, and you can make k whatever number of interest of however many paths you want to be linked by. So we'll make something called the by component and look at the size of that. By components, I think, are a little more common in social networks because it's, it's a little stronger than anybody who can be reached. We think anybody who can be reached by two paths might actually know each other or be more meaningful. right? So we can chart out our by components. We could examine cut points. So again, using strong specifies the directed nature of the data. 
I know this this kind of gets to be a laundry list because it's like just listing things you can measure, but you will have the syntax now to go back to, and you'll have the lecture to be able to think thoughtfully about what that means conceptually. And hopefully that that's the goal. Okay, we could plot our cut points. So we, you know, again set our seed to get the same structure. We tell it to use the network. We set the color to be five plus cut points. I use the five because I think this color is pretty. And it did that, but you could change that to be anything. Okay, so now our cut points are in pink. And those are people, if you took them out of the network, somebody else would be disconnected. Or parts of the components of the network would be disconnected. We can calculate the K core. So these are people who are connected by, um, to at least K of members who have that many connections. So again, we say run the K core function on, ooh, what did I do? Run the K core function on this network. Um, Run the, so again, run the k-core function on this network only considering in degree, and then set our seed to plot it. And I plotted it with rainbow instead of heat colors, and you get something that looks like this. If we want to visualize only the three and four core, we can specify that. So look at our network, only things where that k-core object is greater than two. And we get the three, four, the three core and the four core, like so. so you can see No, so you could, you could um, a couple of ways. So you could specify the color. You could um, plot only the, the four core and see which one drops out, right? So you, could, you can figure it out by the ones on the edges are going to be the lower core because they're always nested within each other more centrally, right? But so if we wanted, yep. So you use that color map cheat sheet that tells you the rainbow colors, or we had that code earlier where you can make a little bar plot of the rainbow colors and it shows them in order. I would do one of those, yep. Here I printed it with the labels just in case that was informative. Again, it's fake data, so it's not. But here would be the labels for the four core. We could also measure cliques. So again, that's the stricter definition. We can take the clique census of our data. We can count cliques of each membership size. So this is where everyone is connected to everyone. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, there's, there's plenty. Um, you can add titles and subtitles and legends to the plot and things like that. So all of that will be in the information if you do help gplot. It'll have that. So the question was, can you add something like a legend? Yes, you definitely can. That's all part of gplot. That's nothing specific to networks. That's just part of graphing in R. Um, so you can kind of follow that up at it, or follow up and make it pretty with like that at any time if you want. So you'll notice we have one clique with five people in it. Not very many. It's a pretty strict definition. Okay. So getting into structural equivalence. There's a lot of ways to measure a distance and similarity in the, according to equivalence that you can explore further. Um, they each kind of have their own unique way that they're calculating it under the hood. We're gonna do an example with the Hamming distance. So it makes a matrix of the similarity and distance score for each pair of nodes. So it's calculating for every node in our network what's its distance to another node. Um, so we would have that information. We're gonna use it here to cluster based on the Hamming distance. So we're gonna say, all right, if you're looking at nodes that are kind of clumpy in terms of their similarity or distance from each other, what's clustering? We print it and it kind of just tells you what you did. So it said we did structural equivalence distance using the Hamming met metric and uh, on our graph. Did we plot it? No. Here, we could plot it, ooh, sorry. I gotta look down here, not up there. We could plot it as a dendrogram, um, which is what you typically do with structural equivalence. It's not typically, very pretty or informative, but you could imagine kind of cutting through these slices at any point if you're interested in particular clusters. We're gonna use it now to make a block model like we did, um, like we talked about in the lecture. So we're going to say, all right, how do we go from here are these clusters that are very similar to each other and aggregate up in a more abstract way through the block model. So here we tell it to do the block model command on our network using that clustering object that we just made. And H kind of sets the cut point that we're interested in. And then we can abstract it. We can extract it to visualize. This code is allowing self-loops. The default is not to let it self-loop, but because we're interested in that, we're going to let it do that. 
So we made something, we said, from that block object, take the information of what block model people are belonging to and make it something called the by image. Now we're going to plot that. And you get something like this. So if you remember in our little toy example, we had that one, two, three of different roles that are kind of self-looped and connected to each other. This is if we took that entire network and said, what kind of positions are there in our network, regardless of who's in them? It would be this. And of course, again, you could label it, you could color code it and um, make a legend and whatever is informative for you, a title. Like ideally, you could do all those things if you're going to put it in a paper. Right? Sure. Yes. Yep. Yep. So you could do, um, and I think Ryan is going to get on this on Thursday. So the question was like, how would you incorporate, or can you incorporate attributes in the block model? Yeah, so you could do things like uh, distance based on attributes. For example, yeah, um, and then block model based on that, or yeah, and you could you could also just like color code or something if you wanted to based on attributes. But if you're block modeling on attributes, so it's easy to incorporate the block model based on attributes, and you will be getting separate code to do that from Brian's lecture. It's it's pretty easy to just make a distance matrix based on that attribute. Um, yes, I don't I don't know how easy it would be to kind of aggregate, yeah, I guess so, uh, to aggregate on the structural ones, I'm not sure. But I mean, that's what it's inherently doing here with the Hamming distance. So I don't know if you could combine the two and like make one shape and one color, because I think that it inherently changes the block model. But you will get the code to do it based on attributes, and it is relatively easy just kind of replacing what we, specifying with what we did within that Hamming distance calculation. Yeah, good question. All right, any questions? We've got just a little bit left, and this is a, a slog, but we're going to do a little bit on bipartite data because I don't think we'll have any other examples of um, bipartite data, and I think that could be really useful. To do that, um, we're going to use iGraph. Bipartite data, I think it, the commands are just better in iGraph. And StatNet, as far as I know, I mean, StatNet, I think, literally updated today, so who knows what's new. But as far as I know, you have to do matrix multiplication to be able to do projections in StatNet. In iGraph, you literally say, like, project, and it does it. So we're going to do that. Remember, StatNet and iGraph don't get along. So if we were to use them both at the same time, it would be like messing up, and we wouldn't know it, and we wouldn't know why, and it wouldn't be working. And so instead, we're going to detach StatNet, which basically says, kick it out of our library. It's like we're closing the book and putting it back on the shelf. So we're going to detach or unload StatNet right here with this code, and we're going to load iGraph. You should have both of these installed. Right? So you have to have both of these packages installed. Um, you have to have iGraph installed to be able to load it into your library. That was part of the, the pre-workshop code. But if you didn't do that, you might get an error now that says, like, what's iGraph? Okay. So again, you get this scary code, but that's not really scary. It doesn't say error or warning. It's just saying, by the way, some things are masked. That's okay. Not a problem. So this is just a reminder to set your working directory, mostly because when I was writing the code, I kept forgetting to set my working directory and it didn't work. We're going to use that Davis data, so the, the Southern Women data set. So you should have a file from the Dropbox that's called Davis. That's a .txt file, a text file. And we're going to tell our read this text file, read CSV, called Davis text. It has a header and it has row names. So we're specifying that, and we're saying, call it this object Davis. And you'll notice the object Davis popped up over here. If you don't want to find it, or you don't want to set your working directory, you can choose it from a pop-up window, take this snippet of code here, and uncomment it. So just do this, run this, and a little window will pop up, and you can go find it. So sometimes if you're you know, pulling data from different places, you don't always want to be recopying and changing all the slashes and all that on a PC. You can always point and click if you need to. Let's look at our data. So it looks good. We've got 18 women who are attending events. Luckily, we, we've got already clean data for this toy example. Um, we're going to make a bipartite network object. So we're telling iGraph, you'll notice the syntax is a little bit different now because we moved from StatNet land to iGraph land. So some of the little things have changed. But we're saying take that Davis de uh, data and make it into a bipartite network, an instance graph called DavisNet. And then we're saying, tell us about this Davis net. And this is what it tells you. So iGraph says, 
This is a UNB3289, which means an undirected named bipartite network with 32 nodes and 89 edges. So it seems reasonable. reasonable. Note that we have nodes for both women and events because it is bipartite data. If we want to look at the types of our two mode data, we say um, look at the vertex attribute in DavisNet, which is type. And it'll tell you that you've got 18 of one type and 14 of the other type. Show each node's name. You'll notice that we can assume the one with human names are the women and the ones with E's are the events. If we want to do a very quick plot, we could say plot this DavisNet thing and do the vertex color by type. So again, we're saying vertex, the vertex attribute of DavisNet, which is type. And we get something like this. So not pretty at all, but it seems like our data is correct and clean and um, bipartite like we want. To make it a better plot, we're going to set the color and shape of the vertices based on type. So we're saying um, for vertex type, if it's a true, make it gold, and if it's false, make it light blue. The other way around, right? Whichever way worked. <laughs> so we're setting the color and shape based on type of that two mode network data. And now when we plot it, we are also doing layout fruchterman rheingold which just helps it spread out a little much, a bit more and not be too clumpy. And we get something like this. So we made all of the women blue circles and all of the events the yellow squares. You can plot specifically to look like a bipartite plot. So layout bipartite separates the two types of nodes. These are often so hard to read that it's hardly worth it. But if you have a small data set, that might be informative if you have two mode network data. Right? And you, you can get some sense of you know, particularly popular events or how things are connected. But that's what a bipartite layout would look like. If we want to make a one mode projection from the bipartite data, so say we want to look at um, women who co-attended events or events that had the same women attending them. In iograph, it's really easy because you just say take that Davis network and do a bipartite projection and call that, I call it Davis proj name it whatever you want, but I just try to name it something transparent that tells me it's the projection of the Davis data. So it makes that object. We could look at our two projections. So again, we've got the first one, which has 18, um, 18 nodes, and that's all of the women, we can tell from the name, right? And then we've got a projection of 14 events, two separate networks now, and they're both weighted because the weights are however many women attended both events or however many events both women attended. So if we want to do a projection of jointly attended events, I'm telling it to project projection number two, make the width, the weight of projection number two of the edges, make the vertex label the name of projection number two, make it gold squares in this layout and give it a title. Right? And that's the syntax to get this. So you'll notice that the edges are weighted based on how many women co-attended. So you've got a skinny line over here because not very many women co-attended events 13 and 6. And you've got a much fatter line between event 8 and 9. Yes? Yeah. Correct. You do want to set the seed just like you did before. I only haven't done it because it's a lazy example data. Yep, but you would. And because we're going to move forward with the women's network, so I'm not going to mess with the events anymore. I don't care about it looking the same. Yep. So you'll notice I set seed right here. That was, oh, if I had been smarter, I would have been like, oh, and it's right here at this line, but I didn't make it there. So now if we want to plot instead of events linked by women, we're going to plot, we're going to plot the women linked by events. So I'm going to set the seed and I'm further going to save this layout to an object called coordinates that I could use later. Right, so I'm going to say use that fruchterman rheingold layout. There's a whole bunch of layouts that you could look up in the, the iGraph syntax. fruchterman rheingold I think, is one of the best kind of spring embedding, embedding algorithms that really spreads things out. Sometimes Kamada Y is another popular one people use. But we're using just the first projection. We're gonna, I'm going to make an object that's called coordinates that I could use later. That's the same thing as setting your seed. So now I'm going to plot this. Again, the first projection now, because we're looking at the women connected to women, weight edges. Use the names from the first projection. Uh, I made the labels a little smaller because their names were gigantic and it was really hard to read. I made the nodes a little bigger and I labeled, I'm using layout, that coordinates object I made above. So that's similar to setting the seed, but I'm gonna 
make one object that will always coordinate my graph, or orient my graph, I suppose is a better term. So this is our co-attendance network of women. So here in Edge is how many events they attended together. And this is a one-mode projection of bipartite data. So I've got some description here, like for example, we could see that you know, Teresa and Evelyn attended a lot more events together than Flora and Helen did. Um, we could start to see a bit of a kind of core periphery structure that there's a few women in the middle who have attended a lot of things together and a few women out at the fringe, right? So if that uh, applies to your question, you know, if your question is about women attending events together or events that are co-attended, you can continue to work with either projection. And this is just the same caution that it is somewhat inherently biased by that art of projection, so don't get too hung up on the exact measure of things. So just like we did before, except now we're in iGraph, so the syntax might be a tiny bit different, but we're saying take, calculate the degree of that first projection. Make a thing called degree, or deg, and let's look at it. So Evelyn attended 17 different events. Calculate betweenness. And we could look at that if we wanted to. So we could compare between this. And it, of course, it's such a tiny network, it's easy to do just by looking at it. But if you wanted to you know, save it into a table and manipulate it in any other way with R, you can. We can calculate eigenvector centrality because it's um, undirected data. Note that for eigenvector centrality, you have to specify vector. Um, if you don't, it'll just print out a whole other bunch of information that you don't really want. So the vector of eigenvector centrality is the part that is the eigenvector centrality of each node. So if that's confusing, you can try it, and then when you look at eigenvector centrality, it'll have a whole bunch of other info that you don't necessarily need. So we're specifying the vector. We can make a little table of all our centralities here. So I'm telling, um, I'm telling R to make a data frame of those three objects that I just made. The, deg, bet, and eig object that stand for degree between us and eigenvector. So take all those values and make them a data frame called coattendance centrality and let's look at it. So I could compare these values across. Again, this is really easy when you have 18 <coughs> nodes. It's a lot harder if you have millions or something like that and you can't do this and you have to you know, be more thoughtful about, about sampling or kind of big data management in that way. You can notice that the centrality is a lot higher compared to some of the other graphs. Right, so we get some inflation from that projection compared to the values we saw with our faux ad health data, for example. And that, again, that's inherent to projection. We could plot their centrality just like we did before. So we can um, make the vertex size that eigenvector centrality measure value. Here, eigenvector is such a tiny number, I did times 20 just to make it visually appealing. No other reason. But you could get a plot of eigenvector centrality of the two mode network like so. So Teresa is popular among popular people. And Dorothy had a lot of ties, but not to the popular people, right? So you can get some sense of this kind of core periphery structure. And that's text of the same thing. So again, you could do any of the network descriptives we did in the first half of this lab thoughtfully on your, your one mode projection of the data, but the interpretation um, is a lot different. There are specific packages that are made for bipartite data or for dealing with the one mode projection of bipartite data. Two of the most common ones I've referenced here, TNET from Tora Upsall and uh, bipartite, which I think comes from ecologists or something. I don't know, it has a lot of like food web and animal stuff in it, but it does the network part just fine. Um, those are two that you would typically see if you're seeing people work with specific bipartite network packages. Um, so if you have that data and you're interested in that, you should definitely follow up there. They do take a very long time to run. At least the, the TNET ones can take a long time to run. So that's part of why we didn't use them in this lab, because it would be very dull of running one thing and me standing up here trying to entertain you while it works. So, um, so just be aware of that, particularly if you're working with big data. There are also more specifications for more specific commands. So like, for example, when you get to ergums on Thursday, there are specific commands in ergums for two-mode network data. So all of that is out there. This is just kind of, again, doing the basics and the bare bones. With that, any questions for the good of the order? No one, no one ever asks a question at the end of the day because you're like, don't ask questions, it's time to go. Okay, I know, that's fine. But please feel free to stick around and I, I hope that's useful for giving you some basics. So thank you.